Welcome back to the main room, everyone. We hope you've had a chance to connect with some of our absolutely amazing alumni leaders who are part of our community, um, and perhaps even taken away some kernels of wisdom to apply to your own unique paths of success. My name is Mami Hidaka. I'm a DAAA Vice Chair at Large and a Trinity 88. And I have the great pleasure of introducing to you our next keynote speaker, Gu Wang. And his presentation is our symposium's version of the Super Bowl's halftime show. It is that amazing. <laughs> So Gu is a 2000 Duke graduate in computer science, and he's about to share not only his path to success, but we are about to actually viscerally experience some of his successes, and we'll learn how his work is bringing more meaning to his life and to that of our society. Now his professional title is Associate Professor at Stanford University's Center for Computer Research in Music and Acoustics. But as you are about to see, a title is so much more, or he is so much more than a title. Good, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Mammy. And uh, thank you to everyone for having me. And I'm just gonna jump right in and tell you a story about uh, Artful Design. And this story actually began some 40 years ago. And uh, well, I thought I'd give you, I, I thought I'd give you my own path, <laughs> life path uh, from the beginnings. I was born in Beijing um, almost 44 years ago. And I was born actually at the uh, seventh floor of that building right there. I grew up with my grandparents and that's me at age 4.5. And uh, my parents were uh, actually working in a different part of the country. This was actually right at the end of the cultural revolution. Mom actually, dad, worked in a car factory in Shanxi. And uh, in Beijing, I still think of as my hometown, even though I've lived most of my life in, in America. And Beijing, well, even to this day has its moments. And uh, well, that's grandma um, who still lives in Beijing. In 2019, uh, in fact, this is on this day in which this picture is taken, grandma uh, celebrated her 100th birthday. So she just celebrated her 102nd birthday um, last month, and uh, she is doing well. And uh, she, she was a high school math teacher, and she also was my math teacher um, when she visited the U.S. with grandpa in the, 19, in the 90s. Um, when I go home, um, I, there are some visceral experiences, um, sublime experiences, you might say, including this. I think most of you will see this and think, and start licking her lips. This is, of course, sauce fry noodles, jajangmian. And uh, even those three words can resonate, right? And of course, it's so much more than just delicious noodles, but this is history. This is family history. When I go home and grandma cooks this for me, I think about all the times that I've come back home to visit her. I think about my childhood. And so this really is a telescoping kind of sublime experience really from food. And I would say that for the, all the things I'm going to talk about today, I think maybe the question is, I'm always trying to get back to things like this bowl of noodles that has so much meaning in it. And how do we design, well, technology that can make us feel like this. So I came to the US uh, when I, at the age of nine and lived with my parents, and that was in Georgia. Um, and, uh, and actually, at the age of 13, uh, mom and dad for reasons I still do not remember, got me an electric guitar um, for my birthday. This is actually later with a different guitar. Um, and also a lot of friends, uh, actually did not have a lot of friends in high school, but had a lot of, a few very good friends. Um, some of whom I'm st I, I still actually still play video games with on a, almost a daily basis. Um, and, and this is kind of the people that really kind of I grew up with. And uh, I started at Duke in 1996, um, and I studied computer science. In fact, uh, with, by taking, also taking a lot of music classes. And, and I remember in my sophomore year, there was, there was a semester in which I had to get from LSRC, which you might remember is the one far end of the West Campus, to Biddle Music Building which is at the far end of the East campus. And so I had to basically run from that to the West campus bus stop, get on the bus, the bus takes me to East campus, and I get, I get to run to Biddle. 
but I think in a way, these two locations represented my really the culmination, I guess, my of these interests of computer science and music. Um, and I still remember actually Professor Astrakhan in computer science saying, there are two good answers to any question. I don't know, and it depends. Well, I got the sense that he was talking about software, right? I also got the sense that maybe, just maybe, he was talking about life and that there is no one-size-fits-all solution to, to, any, to everything and that it's circumstantial. And you've got to really try to understand the context and the circumstances of things. In any case, this kind of began kind of my computer science journey, which took me eventually to Princeton, where, where I did my uh, PhD in computer science. Uh, bottom right is my advisor, Perry Cook, who's like Professor Astrakhan at Duke, was a really influential individual in my life and continues to influence my way of thinking. And also that I think he made it okay to play, be playful in our research. Uh, one of the first things I saw was a coffee mug uh, that Perry had built to make music. And I said, well, hey, you know, if, if my advisor's building that, maybe it's okay for me to do playful things when I, when I, when I do my research. Um, and, and this is kind of, I guess, geographically where my story currently has, has led me, which is Stanford University. I've been at faculty here at Stanford since 2007. It's been a sh very short 14 years and also very long in some ways. And my office is actually located way in the back on the far side of campus uh, behind Memorial Church. And this building is Stanford's Center for Computer Research in Music and Acoustics. Uh, that is spelled CCR Main, it's pronounced Karma. That's me in my office, which I've not seen since March 2020 due to the pandemic. Um, and what is it that I do? Well, I build things. I'm a designer. I make things, uh, mostly with software. I write a lot of code. It's my craft. It's also, I feel like it, it can, it's an artful thing. Um, and for my dissertation, actually, from grad school, I made a programming language for music called Chuck. It's open source, it's freely available, and it's something I'm still working on, actually, to this very day. Uh, there's a whole community behind it. We've used this to actually do things like Laptop Orchestra, which we'll talk a little bit more about shortly. Also, I head up the Virtual Reality and Augmented Reality Design Lab. We're asking questions like, what kind of instruments can we craft in VR, and how might we make music together in VR? And three years ago, I tried to put all of this into a book that is both about design and technology, but also in equal measure about life, about how we design ourselves and through the things we design, whether it's technology, whether it's policy, whether it's just the way our day is going to go. So as you can see, though, I, I, I couldn't help but actually think back to my childhood when I read a lot of comic books. Actually, I read a lot of uh, Adventures of Tintin, Ding Ding Li Xianji. Um, and, uh, and I think the comic book ethos kind of stayed with me. And I thought this is such an interesting way for, for Tintin to tell the story, right? So here, I also take a lot of photos. So I ended up writing a 488-page comic book that asked the following question. What is the nature of design? Like, is this something that we all do? And the short answer is, yeah, we all do this. And uh, also, how do we design well? In, third, in an age of technology, how do we design ethically? So these are the three questions I think the book is, is exploring. And I'm going to give you some examples of each of these uh, and also things that, that I've worked on or my research group has worked on. Um, back in 2006, in eight, I co-founded a company called Smule. And one of the first things, uh, first the first musical instrument that I designed uh, as part of Smule uh, was Ocarina. I'm gonna demo that for you. And in Ocarina, really what you're doing here is you are uh, playing music by blowing into your iPhone. So I'm gonna try to demonstrate here. And um, yeah, uh, as you can see, I'm blown to the microphone. Multi-touch is used to map to pitch. Accelerometer, or the tilt of the phone, uh, is mapped to vibrato, so. As uh, you can hopefully hear through the Zoom setup, that when I tilted the phone further down, there's more vibrato. You can play little ditties with this.
for example. And you can have a lot of fun with, uh, with this thing. And you could ask, is this a toy or is it an instrument? And in a way, I think maybe it's a little bit of both. Now, this is Ocarina in gameplay mode. And as you can see, it's not just any one element, but it's audio, it's visual, it's interaction, and trying to put that into a kind of a unity, um, something that is playful, but also it's, I guess, part of the joke here is that this thing actually works as an instrument that people can learn and learn to get better at playing. Um, but yet there's another dimension to Ocarina, and that is a social dimension. In Ocarina, you can listen to uh, other people blown to their phones from around the world. Here's someone from the East Coast playing O Shenandoah. Who is that? Well, the app is not really designed to tell you. And in a way, this is a kind of an anonymous social network based on music. And by actually removing, you know, kind of this, this need for identity, we wanted to encourage a kind of playfulness. And indeed, in Ocarina, you could, if you like what you what you heard, you can. Uh, you can um, hit that heart on the top left, but actually in this case, it's a one-way street. You can't actually check to see how many people actually heart your performance. And as the philosopher John Stuart Mill once said, you know, uh, eloquence is heard, but poetry is overheard. And I think we try to build a system that was for overhearing. And if there's another philosophy behind this is that technology maybe just maybe should create calm. Um, and this is uttered by Mark Weiser, who's one of the forerunners of ubiquitous pervasive computing. And this is a remarkable statement. This isn't saying, well, technology is going to solve all our problems or technology is going to create wealth, but rather the technology could and should bring us a kind of inner peace. And what a wonderful vision for we, what we might do with technology if we chose to do that. And actually, in 2009, this is a review left for Ocarina in the App Store, actually. Um, this is my peace on Earth. I'm currently deployed in Iraq, and hell on Earth is an everyday occurrence. The few nights I'm a half off, I'm deeply engaged in this app. The globe feature that lets you hear everybody else in the world playing is the most calming art I've ever been introduced to. It brings the entire world together without politics or war. It is the exact opposite of my life. Deployed U.S. soldier. This is very humbling, obviously. So for, we made this whimsical, playful thing, but it's humbling to think that anyone, even one other person, derived even just a moment of peace from, from something that we made. And this is to say that, well, good design is useful. It enables us. But great design, what I think makes design truly artful is when it understands us, it understands something about who we are, about our relationship with another person or who we were, how we come to be the person that we are. If, if art could, could in some ways understand us, can the tools that we make similarly afford this kind of understanding? And that is really the question in an artful design. And we've tried to apply this kind of thinking to various things like the laptop orchestra in which we actually have uh, an ensemble of laptops, um, and special speaker arrays that we built out of Ikea salad bowls. And this is to keep sound local to the instrument and to the player. Um, and this is what it sort of sounds like um, in concert. And I say sort of because this is just a video recording. And really you wanna get close to this thing to really hear it. But in any case, in this players have um, have an interface that's tracking the location of their hands. And using this interface, they are pulling a sound out of the ground, so to speak, and then shaping it with their movement. And then there's the VR lab. Um, 
And uh, I'll just show you one thing from actually my PhD student, Kang Woo Kim, who's created Musical City. And in this Musical City, um, all the things you hear are also seen and vice versa. And you can turn on buildings and they kind of have a musical function. The Ferris wheel controls pitch. Things get kind of really get going. You can see there's an audio visual correspondence. The things you see, you also hear. The things you hear, you also see kind of a visual action. There are planes, there are automobiles. And uh, as things really get going, we'll go to the moon. And on the moon, there are some rabbits. And the rabbits are making rice cake. From their concoction comes a train of music. And this train is going to go and find its way peacefully through the city. I don't know about you, but this puts me at peace. It makes me want to live in a world, a place that makes me feel like this. UFOs come out of the sky, they're not here to hurt anyone, but to play music together. And at the end of the night, everything peacefully turns off and we're ready for the next day. All of this brings me to, to this final part, is, which is say, well, well, if we talk about paths to anything, right? Um, life paths, it's, it's choices. And how we make them is a matter of what we could call design. And in this age, what does it mean to design ethically? And why would we want to do that? Specifically for technology, what does ethics even mean? Does that mean do stuff that does no harm? Or can it also mean do things that proactively do good? And also on, on an aspect of quality, is this, what about this question? How do we want to live with our technologies? And what if we design by asking ourselves not one, but all of these questions? And so in artful design, I say there has to be an artful, an artistic leap on the part of the design of the results from seeing and feeling the world at large. Designers are less problem solvers and more artists, philosopher, engineers of useful things that understand us. And so if we believe this, then, you know, I'm a professor, so I'm thinking about how to really educate students, the, the designers of today and tomorrow, to be more than a specialist, but a kind of technological artist, a moral ethical inventor, and a system designer who can contextualize what they make into the systems for which it's made. And so I want to leave you with this image, um, which is uh, in higher ed, we have the notion of an I-shaped student. That's a person who narrowly just focuses on one discipline, like computer science. But then we're like, we have the T-shaped student. We're like, that I is not so good, but the T, there's some breadth, right? The, the, the top bar symbolizes breadth. In artful design, I introduced this notion of a pie-shaped student where on one leg, it's disciplinary expertise. On the second, on the one on leg on the right, it's domain expertise. For me, that was public health or music. My discipline was computer science. But the top bar is what I call the aesthetic lens. It's a philosophical, artistic, and moral lens that gives broader meaning and context in bridging the two legs. And in a way, well, this is... Something for all of us is to say, and to be a good engineer, good designer, good anything, you have to be also good at things outside of your discipline. To be a good computer scientist, you also should seek to be something in the humanities. Take philosophy courses, literature courses, art, music courses, social science courses. Because to be a good engineer, you also have to try to be a good human. Otherwise, how are you going to build things for this world? And so this is kind of what I put all into this book, which, you know, is a comic book, all 488 pages of it, which I go through and ask these questions, but also look at a lot of examples from buildings to school supply, to software, to audiovisual design, to instrument design, artificial intelligence with humans in the loop, to uh, apps I designed for Smule that are playful, uh, but to, to be there, not just as entertainment, but as a forms of expression, social design, and on this last point, this is my last demo, and um, and this uh, this is in our app, which was called Glee Karaoke at the time, which is a social karaoke app. You can sing, but you can also listen to people on the globe and then add your voice in a plus one kind of a way, in a kind of an ad hoc global chorus. In the wake of the 2011 earthquake and tsunami disaster in Japan, a woman reached out in Tokyo, sing a rendition of Lean on Me, and 
she invited the world to sing with her. In a matter of weeks, 4,000 people joined in, presumably most of them strangers from all around the world. This is what it sounds like at about 1,000 people. That's design, an artful design, so I suppose, in a nut nutshell of what of thinking of, for all of for all of us to think about. You know, what kind of how do we want to live with our technology, and how do we want to live with one another? And as I hope this example showed, um, I think when design really works, it's the technology that disappears, and what's left, you would hope, is something good, something goodly human. And this is to say, the things that we make will come back to make us. And this is the first and last thing from Artful Design is that the things we put in motion today, they will, they will come back and they don't just have consequences. They will actually shape the way we live and shape the way we are. So in a nutshell, I guess starting with that humble apartment in the middle of Beijing, it's 44 years ago, this is where I've come to, to do these days, <laughs> these years, which is, you know, kind of what we work on, but also why. And it's something I call design for flourishing. And I think the question here has also got to be who flourishes? Are we designing tools to serve the few or can it be the many? From the many, can it be from most? And can we go from most to hopefully all? Now, I know that's a tall order. That's a, that's a challenge. But also, that's the work. And that is Artful Design. And you can find more at artful.design. And um, I want to thank you all so much for having me. And uh, hopefully we'll have time for a few questions. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I mean, I have, I've seen a lot of uh, a lot of Zoom presentations, but this was this was something else. This is really amazing, um, both optically and uh, in terms of content. Um, so we do have a short uh, Q and A period, and we have a few questions um, coming up here. So one is, you know, what kind of job is suitable for us? Uh, and this uh, and this person in the audience says, I find it hard to find a job because I don't know how to define myself, mm. designer or technician. And it seems like you've really designed your life. In, in a way that's very, it's, it's not very traditional. Um, you know, how did you, how do you find your path? Um, not by design, actually, ironically. The one thing that I think is not designable is, is, is life, actually. This is, I, I don't, I wouldn't believe the thing anyone tells you about designing your life because that you can design chairs, you can design software, you can design tools and musical instruments. Life is the one thing we, none of us get to really design. Um, I, and I looked at grandma who's 102 and I, I asked how much of her life was designable. Some, mostly not. And maybe I have more of a chance to design, but back to this question, what job is suitable for us? I don't know. And it depends back to, back to professor Astrakhan's words from, from, from Duke. And I say that because I did not design myself into this. I, I don't think I could have, I followed my interest. And, and I, had, I was lucky to have people like my parents, my grandparents, and, and my, my professors and advisors like really encourage me to follow my, my interests. And I realized then it's not enough to actually just follow your interests. You got to like actively fight for your interests. Um, when I was at Duke, there was just one electronic music class taught by Professor Scott Lindroth. It was offered every other year. Right. And that was not like music technology, computer music was not even a thing. And I was like, am I even doing the right thing here? I don't know. And I just went for it because you know what? I'm so interested in music, but also I'm so interested in building things. And that's why I, I think I, I, that's why I was a computer science major. Um, I don't know. It depends. And uh, I, I wish I have a better answer for you, but I, I think in a way, like, it's it's the part that's there's a part of life that's undesignable. Oh, well, being that this is a DAAA uh, symposium, how do you think your Asian heritage has actually impacted your career? You know, you could have chosen uh, to be 
Silicon Valley, uh, you know, just a founder. Instead, you've chosen the professor route. You know, it's yeah, so well, uh, I've been both, and uh, in it, but the Asian part is really, um, I feel like I was very fortunate to have like. Both my grandparents were teachers. Um, dad is a teacher, um, and so like I've, I've, you know, a lot of my family are teachers. So I, I think, in a way, I feel like growing up Asian, being born in China, I come to realize I have like kind of fairly unconventional parents and grandparents. Um, and they, like I think most other Asian parents, are like you need to find a foothold in this world. Uh, you need to do something that will help you speak to your livelihood so you can stand up in this world, right? So that part is there. But also, I think because there were teachers, they wanted from a young age to, to try to figure out what I'm interested in, but not to do it heavy handedly. Like they bought me an accordion at the age of seven, my grandparents did, just to see if I like it. And eventually, like I gave it up after two years and they were totally cool with it age of 13, my parents got me that electric guitar, which completely, that one totally stuck. Cause I'm like, man, I want to rock. And, uh, but then later it was like, I want to build things that help other people rock. So I think trying to, I think having parents who help me discover my interest without forcing them upon me, like the worst thing probably my parents could have done for me was to say, learn the accordion, get, learn the piano, learn the violin and get, you know, be long, long. I don't know. Like get to be like the most masterful no they said just play and see if you like it and i think they knew that if i found something i really loved that i have a chance of making a job out of it and and to them they realized that is life's one of greatest life's greatest choice if you can play at your job and get paid for it and that's the dream that is maybe that's what it means to flourish so in any case, I, I, I will credit just the, my luck, but also really credit my, my parents, grandparents, and my teachers, and, and now students for just egging me on and uh, giving me the space to play. That really sounds like, you know, you've, you've stayed open-minded and that's really helped you find your path. So anyway, our Q&A is, is, is about to end. And is there a good way for, for our audience to get in touch with you if they have more questions? Yes. Um, so I have a couple of links up here. So uh, artful.design slash author.html has a links to a lot of the things I do, but also you can find me in different ways. Um, also, I'm going to put my, uh, I'm, I'm going to put my email into, into chat. Uh, that's my Stanford email. Feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'm admittedly, I'm not great at email, but I always read them, but I will, I will do my best. But Wonderful. please do reach out and, uh, and, and, you know, I'm look okay. forward to, thank to connecting. Thank, thank you, Mammy. Thank you so much.